I'm Joshua Hamlin in Stockholm, Sweden, and behind me is the Vasa Ship Museum. Now, to understand the story and the history behind this fascinating ship, you have to understand the context of what was going on in Europe at the time. So this was built during the Thirty Years' War, which were the famous religious wars that took place in the first half of the 17th century in Europe famous for being wars between the Catholics and the Protestants. Now, Sweden was Protestant, and so the Swedish king, Gustavus II Adolphus, was trying to expand the Swedish Empire, while at the same time fighting the Catholics, particularly the Polish. And so as he was doing that, he was looking to greatly expand his army and his navy, which is where the Vasa came in. The Vasa was one of four ships commissioned. It had a sister ship that was the same size as it, and then there were two other smaller ships that were commissioned at the same time, so four in total. The Swedish king's goal with the Vasa was to make a clear statement about the power of the Swedish military. So it was full of symbols throughout the ship. It's basically a floating piece of propaganda is what it was at the time because there's tons of symbols and artwork that represent the power of Sweden over its enemies, again, particularly over Poland. So there's a hiding Polish aristocrat nearby the large lion on the front, which uh, the king was known as the, the Lion of the North in Sweden. And so that was kind of his symbol. And he had kind of the Polish aristocrat cowering in the background as uh, a sign of force from Sweden. There's also a lot of imagery to do with Rome, where uh, the king compared himself to the Roman Emperor Augustus, and many Roman emperors are placed throughout the ship to, to show kind of that almost a lineage trying to go back saying, uh, hey, Sweden is kind of the, the modern Roman Empire, and so that's kind of where they get their legitimacy from. Also a way of combating the, some of the, the German states and empires who were supposed to be kind of the, the modern Roman Empire at the time as well, and so that was a way to combat that. By doing this, another part of the, the symbols and all of that was the great painting and how bright everything was. There was lots of gold throughout it. The, the lions and things were painted with gold and then some very bright paint throughout the ship just so that people could see this coming from afar and really see what a symbol this was of Swedish power at the time. Directly behind me here is a 1 to 10 scale model of the Vasa and this ship was built from 1985 to 1990 but the colors weren't added until 2008 because it took them 12 years of researching all of the different pigments and styles of color that were used on the, the real ship, the Vasa itself, before they could color in the model that they to get it as accurate as possible here. So the colors are amazing on the model here and it really gives you an idea of just how beautiful this ship would have been when it was built and when it briefly floated here in Stockholm Harbor. Probably the reason the Vasa is as famous as it is today and the reason it's been able to be so well preserved is because of what happened shortly after it launched on August 10th, 1628. It had 64 cannons on it at this point and was all decked out in all of its glory and bright paint, ready to set sail on its maiden voyage. So it was launched into Stockholm Harbor, sailed for about 20 minutes. As it passed the palace, it let out a salute with its cannons and the gun ports were open in all of its glory. And then about 20 minutes in, a gust of wind hit and it then sunk. And one of the major problems with it was that since they had done that salute with the cannons, they had left the lowest level of gun ports open. So when the wind hit, it tipped the ship and water poured into that lowest part of gun ports and it began to sink. And it took only five minutes for it to sink to the bottom of Stockholm Harbor. So basically about 25 minutes from when it set sail to when it was on the bottom of the harbor. And this was the glory of the Swedish fleet and it went down that quickly. So really a tragic event. The numbers for how many died aren't exactly clear. Uh, it's about approximately 30 to 40 is what most people think. Women and children on there as well because it was customary for the, the families of some of the sailors and the officers to join them on the maiden voyage and then they would have gotten off at one of the islands uh, outside of Stockholm later uh, in the voyage if it had been successful. And so some women and uh, younger children uh, sank with the ship as well. Now we're going to take a look inside a model of the top gun deck they he have here in the Vasa Museum. And as you can see, as I walk underneath here, there was not a lot of headspace at all for the sailors here on these gun decks. And then obviously the main reason that we have these decks is for the cannons. And so you can see the cannons on display here. Uh, they've got several that they've recreated to show what it would have looked like on the top gun deck of the Vasa. 
Behind me here you see how many of the Vaza's cannons were salvaged a few decades after it sank, still in the 17th century. They would send out divers standing on an iron plate here in this bell, and when the bell was lowered into the water, a natural air pocket would form. You can see some illustrations here. And so the diver was still able to breathe. He would hold on to an iron hook, which he then attached to a cannon, uh, along with ropes, and using that they were able to pull up many of these cannons. So using this way, they were able to salvage all but three of the Devaza's cannons in the 17th century. So when it was eventually pulled up in the 20th century, only three of the cannons were still on the ship. The Vasa sat on the bottom of Stockholm Harbor for 333 years until salvage began in 1961. Now this was a long process that took place over several decades until the 1990s when the museum was actually built that now houses the Vasa. Over that time period they had to constantly keep the wood of the ship soaked so that the, it would not dry out and rot and so they were always keeping it soaked down for quite a number of years as they preserved it and tried to salvage as much as they could and found skeletons. They found about uh, 20 skeletons uh, around the ship and in the ship when, when they pulled it up and then all, all sorts of other objects that really give great insight into the kind of life and times of the, the people in the 17th century here in Stockholm and in Sweden. After the sinking, an inquiry was opened and they looked into uh, why the, the ship sank and trying to figure out is there someone in particular to blame here. The shipwright actually uh, died with the ship and so uh, obviously he was one of the people that would have been towards the top of that list but he was dead so they couldn't really do anything about that. In the end no one was actually convicted or anything. There was no particular blame put on a one group of people or one person though a lot of the blame was sort of pointed towards the king because he had pushed those those uh, builders so much to try to get the ship done and a lot of people kind of thought he was at fault but obviously a powerful king at the time you can't convict him of this and so uh, in the end no one was actually convicted and the inquiry moved on. Today the Vasa is 98% original and work is still being done on the ship right now. They're replacing a lot of the bolts with stainless steel bolts just to help preserve the ship for as long as possible. So I'd encourage you to definitely check this out if you're in Stockholm or visiting Sweden. The museum is well worth a visit. They've laid it out really nicely. There's several floors of exhibits. They give really good context uh, around the building of the ship, the sinking of it, the people that were on it, all sorts of really good information and have a lot of cool stuff to see in the museum. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. It costs 130 Swedish crowns for an adult and 110 for a student. So uh, that gives you some idea of the price there. And there's some excellent tours in English as well as several other languages that take place throughout the day that are well worth going on. They're about 25 minute long tours. They give a lot of good information. There's also a good uh, video that's about 17 minutes long that kind of introduces the whole thing as well when you come in. It's well worth watching. So definitely make sure to hit up both of those things when you visit the museum.